Hi, everyone. Um, we'll get started here. Um, and then as people join, they can just come in. Uh, so welcome to the webinar today, um, the Federal Trade Commission response to technology misuse and abuse. We're really excited to have you all here. Uh, my name is Jess Stasko. I'm a program assistant here at the Stocking Resource Center. Um, can you all hear me? Can you type in the chat box if you can hear me? Just so I know I'm not talking to myself. Okay, cool. Looks like we have a consensus. Awesome. Um, so if you're not familiar with the Stocking Resource Center, uh, we, um, we're a program of the National Center for Victims of Crime, and we're a national TA provider, which means we provide training and technical assistance to people all across the country. Um, and we have tons of resources on our website that I want to point out. Um, we have fact sheets, we have brochures, all kinds of stat, um, stats, um, and they're all available uh, at uh, www.victimsofcrime.org slash SRC, so Stocking Resource Center. So feel free to reproduce anything that you see in this webinar today or on the PowerPoint. Um, just shoot us a quick email or give us a call and let us know just so we can keep track of that. Um, but we'd love to have you share the information with others. And just to let you know, the recording of this webinar will be available, hopefully in about 24 to 48 hours um, after today. And that is available on our website too. Under the Trainings tab, there's a whole page of um, webinar archives. You can check this one out, and there's a bunch of other ones there too. So uh, we're going to go through a little bit of how to use this technology. Um, so we're using iLink right now. So we have a few options using this uh, technology. We can raise our hand, that little hand icon. You can give feedback to us, any of us the presenters. Um, and then you can chat in the chat box, which a few of you have already done. So you can do the public chat, which is what um, a lot of you are doing. You can also do a private chat if there's anyone um, of the participants that you want to privately chat with. Um, you're more than welcome to do that. If you at any point have any technical difficulties, um, you can private chat me. My name is Jess Faisco. You can email me. That's my email there. Um, if you um, just, if there's something you think that we can work out ourselves, if the reason the program crashes, if you're having anything major, um, call iLink. Uh, that's their number right there. They're really responsive. Um, they're great. So uh, hopefully we don't have any technical problems. But yeah. So let's try out um, the raise your hand feature. Can everyone raise their hand if um, you've worked with a stalking victim before? Okay. Looks like about a half, well about two thirds of people have. Awesome. So now can you just introduce yourself in the chat? Um, how many people you have with you, the organization that you're from, and where you're located? Um, and maybe if the weather's good near you, you can share that with us too. Everyone's having great weather. I love it. I'm in D.C. right now, um, and it's actually sunny and uh, mid-70s, so it's kind of perfect right now. Great. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks, everyone, for doing that. Um, so I want to know, we're going to take a poll with the poll feature, and I want to know if you can tell us what your profession is. So what best describes your role or occupation or title? And then if none of these apply, um, you can click other and then type it in the chat box just so we know um, who's with us today. Can you all see the, the quiz there? Oh, good, good. People are responding.
we'll just wait another second here and make sure everyone gets a chance. So it looks like the majority of people um, work for a domestic violence program. Uh, we also have some law enforcement uh, officers and attorneys. Um, and then a bunch of other people that uh, thank you for putting in the chat box there. Um, so I'm just reading these. It's really interesting. And it's good to know uh, who's on the webinar here today with us. All right. So I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Rebecca, here to introduce our presenters. Uh, Rebecca, you want to take it over? Thanks so much, Jess. Hi, everyone. I'm Rebecca Drakey. I'm the Deputy Director of the Stalking Resource Center. And we are delighted today to have folks with us from the FTC to guide us through this webinar. So just a quick, um, before I turn it over to them, I want to let folks know that we have certainly built in time in this webinar to ask questions of the presenters. So if you have a question, if something comes up, um, please do type it into the chat box either publicly or you can chat directly with me, Rebecca Drakey, and I will make sure that the presenters get those questions as we go along. We've built in some, some places here for questions and comments. So again, just feel free to chat either publicly or privately with Rebecca Drakey, and we'll make sure that um, Jacqueline and Lisa get your questions. So with us today, we have Jacqueline Connor, who is an attorney at the Division of Privacy and Identity Protection at the FTC in Washington, D.C. Uh, Jacqueline investigates and litigates violations of U.S. laws enforced by the Commission that govern the privacy and security of consumer information. And Lisa Schifferly is also an attorney with the FTC. She's in the, divisions, um, the Commission's Division of Consumer and Business Education. And there she regularly trains advocates across the country on identity theft, scams, privacy, and technology. So we are very fortunate to have them both with us here today, and I am going to turn it over to them. Great. Thanks so much. And thanks to NCBC and the Stalking Resource Center for sponsoring this webinar. And thanks to everyone in the audience for joining us. And more importantly, thank you all for the important work you're doing helping domestic violence victims. Before I came to the FTC, I was a legal services attorney. And I didn't do DV work, but I handled a few cases when they were short-staffed. And all I can say is that you people who do that on a daily basis are very special people who are doing really important work for a lot of people who really need your help. So thank you. And today we're going to talk about online safety for domestic violence and stalking victims. And this is a really important topic um, because according to the Stalking Resource Center, more than one in four stalking victims report that technology is being used as part of the stalking. Um, I think Jessica needs to turn over the PowerPoint control to us so we can advance the slides. So as I was saying, um, more than one in four stalking victims report technology is an element of the stalking. And the stalkings are often someone the victim knows. In fact, they're often an intimate partner or former intimate partner, which means they have access to the technology that the victim may be using, which makes it even harder to protect against. So what we're going to talk about today is the FTC's role in stopping the misuse of technology by stalkers and abusers. First, we're going to give you an overview of our consumer and business education, and then talk about our complaint gathering system, and finally, law enforcement and policy recommendations. I should mention, and Jacqueline will go into law enforcement in more detail, but at the outset I want to mention that the FTC is a civil law enforcement agency, not a criminal law enforcement agency. So we don't and can't prosecute any of these crimes, um, but we do have creative ways of trying to address these issues through our cases dealing with online safety and privacy and through our consumer and business education. So we'll tell you more about that. And then Jacqueline will also talk about the tools that stalkers use. And then I'll come back to talk to you about online safety tips, both on computers and mobile phones, and in particular, some tips that we've come up with for domestic violence victims. And the next slide talks about the FTC's rule. We still don't seem to have control of the PowerPoint. Um, so thank you for advancing that slide. 
The FTC, like I said, offers consumer business education, complaint gathering, and law enforcement. So I'm going to talk to you first about consumer education, especially consumer education on online safety and the tools that you and the victims you work with can use. Next slide, please. Uh, that went too far. <laughs> Oh, perfect. Okay, thank you. So the tools that the FTC has in terms of online safety is OnGuard Online, Netcetera, and Living Life Online. And I'll talk about each of these in turn in more detail. Um, first, OnGuard Online is the latest cybersecurity news and tips. You can sign up for OnGuard Online blogs and check its regular content at onguardonline.gov. I'm sorry, before we go further, can we try to fix the PowerPoint? We don't seem to be able to advance the slides. Lisa, at the top, um, do you see uh, right by the numbers there should be some back and forward arrows that you might be able to see? Like right sort of at the top left hand? Yeah. Yep, you should, uh, can you advance them? Yep, there you go. Okay. Great. Okay, perfect. All right, thank you. So now we're set. The regular way we were advancing the slides didn't work, so this way will work. So the tools that we have for consumer education online safety are OnGuard Online, et cetera, and Living Life Online. So I'll start with OnGuard Online. As I said, that involves the latest cybersecurity news and tips that you can sign up for. And it includes sections on understanding mobile apps and things like how to check permissions to see what information is being accessed on your mobile phone. Um, of course, as you'll hear more from Jacqueline, there are certain spyware apps that can be installed and you cannot necessarily see that they're there. But for a lot of apps, you can check permissions to see what information is being accessed. All about our mind also includes tips like how to use public Wi-Fi and information about how information transferred by public Wi-Fi is not as secure because the public Wi-Fi doesn't encrypt that information. We'll get into the specific tips later in the presentation, but I just want to tell you about the tools right now. Another major tool we have is Netcetera, and this is an outreach toolkit that's designed both as a guide for parents or advocates, and then there's also a partner booklet for teens. Um, and we mentioned this because uh, teens can be victims of stalking too. In fact, um, we saw on the Stalking Resource Center's website that the age group from 18 to 24 has the highest rate of stalking victims, and that uh, more than half of female victims and one third of male victims were stalked before the age of 25. So Netcetera could be a good tool for the teen population in terms of online safety. And it goes over how to make safe decisions online. It's part of our OnGuard online suite of materials. It discusses things like cyberbullying, um, GPS, and how not to broadcast your location to friends or to abusers and stalkers, and also social networking and managing who sees your content and who can't see your content. This is our top publication of the FTC, most ordered publication, so I'd really encourage people to check it out um, and use it with the victims that you work with, especially younger victims. Living Life Online is for an even younger age group, ages 8 to 14, and it has short articles, activities, and quizzes. Um, and I must admit that I was surprised looking on the Stalking Resource Center to learn that such a high percentage of people experience stalking between the ages of 11 and 17, 14% 14 of female stalking victims and 11% of male stalking victims. So Living Life Online would be a good publication for the younger age set. Uh, we also have a blog that we wrote about a month or so ago um, with the help of NCBC and the Stalking Resource Center specifically about domestic violence and online safety. And you'll get most of that content um, right now today, but if you want to check out the blog, you can do that at ftc.gov. In addition to educating consumers about their rights, 
The FTC also educates businesses about their responsibilities. And in the online safety context, um, this means things like giving them tips about mobile app security, things like take stock of the data that you collect and retain to make sure you aren't collecting more than you need to, using encryption when information is being transferred, and also considering how you encrypt or otherwise protect data that's stored on a user's device, perhaps with passwords or otherwise. Um, we give this kind of advice so legitimate businesses who develop apps can try to make them more secure so they aren't unnecessarily accessing people's personal information and putting people at risk unnecessarily. Um, of course, there will be the illegitimate businesses who don't listen to any of this advice and make the evil spyware that can be used by stalkers, um, but that's where our law enforcement component comes in, which we'll get to shortly. So in addition to our consumer and business education, another way that the FTC works to address um, online safety and really all of the fraud and identity theft issues that we deal with is through complaint gathering. At ftc.gov slash complaint, you can file complaints on behalf of victims or have victims file the complaints themselves. This is not just the FTC's database, it goes into the Consumer Central <laughs> Network, which is a federal government centralized database of ID theft and fraud victim complaints so that even though we are not a criminal law enforcement agency, the FBI and DOJ and local law enforcement have access to the complaints filed with the FTC and in Consumer Sentinel in order to target their investigations as well. And we do encourage you to file complaints with the FTC um, because we use them not only to track trends but also to find targets for our law enforcement actions. And with that, I will turn it over to Jacqueline, who's going to talk about some of our cases, and then I'll return at the end to share the more specific consumer education advice we have in terms of online safety tips for stalking and domestic violence victims. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, hi, this is Jacqueline. Um, I am an attorney with the Division of Privacy and Identity Protection, like was just said. So I do a lot of the law enforcement work here. Um, the FTC, like Lisa said, is a civil law enforcement agency, and our main authority, enforcement authority, comes from Section 5 of the FTC Act. It's a flexible law that can be applied to many different situations, entities, or technologies, and we usually litigate where we see that there are deceptive or unfair acts or practices. Many of our law enforcement actions affect online safety for domestic violence and stalking victims, and I've listed three cases right there that we have done, remote spy, designer wear, and trend net. Um, I will briefly discuss these three cases and why I think they're relevant to today's discussion. But before I do that, I want to quickly discuss a case that's not listed here. Um, this case is from 2006, and it was FTC versus AccuSearch. And this was a case about the online selling of cell phone records without the consumer's knowledge or consent. And the FTC won that case through summary judgment and some of the best evidence was from consumers whose cell phone records were used by abusers, and in one case, a stalker. We also had an expert, who many of you probably know, Cindy Southworth, who um, wrote about the ways that cell phone records could be used to harm women fleeing from domestic violence. So this is a really important case because it demonstrates how important our relationship is with you all, the advocates and the attorneys because this evidence proved invaluable to helping us win summary judgment. And it also shows how it could help us learn things about the cases that we're proceeding with and also kind of tips us off to where we should be looking more, what areas we should be looking closer to into and stuff like that. So please, you know, we're open to communication, so please talk to us whenever. The next slide. So the first case is Remote Spy. Um, it's, the real name is actually Cyber Spy Software. And this was a case from 2010. And what happened was there was keylogger spyware was used to secretly monitor unsuspecting consumers' computers. So what would happen is spyware was dis disguised as innocuous email attachment, so it would look like a picture or a music file. And that, the defendants provided instructions on how to discuss, disguise these files. 
So when the consumer clicked on the attachment, the keylogger spyware was silently installed on their computer so they wouldn't know it was being installed or that it was there. And once it was installed, the spyware was able to record every keystroke typed on the computer, so that would include passwords, was able to capture images of the computer screen, so screenshots, and it could record the websites visited. And the defendants in this case ended up settling with the Federal Trade Commission. And the outcome, among other things, is that the defendants cannot provide purchasers of programs with the means to disguise the product as an innocent file or email attachment. They're also required um, to provide notice with this software that the program has been downloaded and obtain consent from the computer owners before the software can be installed. Another case is Designerware. Um, this is where it was a software and design company, and they licensed software to rent to own stores. And this software enabled stores to track and recover rented computers. So one of the things was that this software would allow the stores to disable a computer remotely when the computer, uh, consumer was late making payments or had violated the rental contract. Um, if the computer also had a wireless card installed, it could track the public Wi-Fi hotspots that the card saw or connected to, and the consumers had no idea that it was happening. But most problematic was likely the, the software had an add-on program known as detective mode, which when it was activated, it could log the keystrokes, capture screenshots, take photographs using the computer's webcam, and it even presented a fake software program registration screen that asked for information from consumers. So when they typed it in, they thought they were registering for something, but in fact, they were just providing their personal contact information to the software. Next slide. So the features of this software program were used without notice to or consent from the consumers who were renting these computers. The design company, Designerware, ended up settling with us, and the outcome was that they were banned from using monitoring software like detective mode. They were prohibited from using the geolocation tracking without consumer consent and notice. And besides Designerware, there were seven rent-to-own companies who are also charged with breaking the law and who also settled with us, including Aaron's, which is a common name. And we also had two individuals in this case settle with us. Um, where they were liable because they had direct, they directed or controlled the acts or practices that we said were against the law. Next slide. And the third case is the most recent one is TrendNet, and um, this was a this is a company that markets video cameras that are designed to allow consumers to monitor their homes remotely. So, you know, this, these are the nanny cams that you put in your house so you can see what's happening at home. The problem was that they had lax security practices that led to hundreds of consumers' private camera feeds being made public on the internet when a hacker exploited and publicized this. So there were live feeds of hundreds of cameras available online. They also settled with the FTC. And the outcome, among other things, was that they were required to establish an information security program to protect the security, confidentiality, or integrity of information. They were also required to notify consumers about the security issues that they had and the availability of a software update that would correct these issues. Besides law enforcement, uh, the Federal Trade Commission also participates in policy recommendations in this arena. Um, here we have some examples here. Uh, first is congressional testimony. Um, an example is in June of 2014, the Bureau of Consumer Protection's director, Jessica Rich, testified before the Senate Subcommittee for Privacy, Technology, and the Law. Um, and she testified on the draft legislation that was known as the Location Privacy Protection Act of 2014, and she expressed privacy concerns regarding consumers' geolocation information. Uh, specifically, she said in that testimony that because geolocation information can reveal a consumer's movements in real time, as well as provide a detailed, comprehensive record of a consumer's movements over time, use of this sensitive information can raise privacy concerns. Geolocation information can divulge intimately personal details about an individual. She also highlighted that the FTC has used its enforcement authority to take action against companies that have engaged in unfair or deceptive practices involving geolocation information and endorsed legislation that protects consumer sensitive geolocation information. Other examples of ways that the FTC makes policy recommendations are through workshops, we have an example there, the mobile device tracking workshop last year, and we also publish 
staff reports. Um, a recent one in January of this year was uh, Internet of Things, Privacy and Security in a Connected World. But another report of interest to this group might be the Protecting Consumers in an Era of Rapid Change Recommendations for Businesses and Policymakers, and that was published in 2012. You can go onto ftc.gov and you can find information about all this policy recommendations, all these policy recommendations, testimony, workshops, and reports. Great, so Jack, that, this is mm -hmm. just Rebecca. I just want to jump in here for a second and pause to see if any of the folks have any questions about the cases that you had mentioned. Uh, one question, as folks are thinking about if they have anything they wanted to chat about, um, one question that came through, someone was wondering in the designware case, how was the detective mode activated? They're wondering, is, was it like an innocent looking file that users might click on? No, this was, those were the rent to own computers. So they were installed, the software was installed on the computers before um, the rent to own stores like gave the computers out. And so I believe, and I'd have to double check all the documents, but they're also available on FTC.gov that detective mode was something that the rent-to-own store could kind of in, like enable from their end and then it could like collect information and they could change how often information was being collected. I think it, at most it could report back like every two minutes, send back information. So it wasn't something that consumer didn't see it, they didn't give notice. Um, the only thing that they would see there is the fake registration screen. Great, thank you so much. One other question, and maybe you're going to talk about this, um, that's come through is someone's wondering when spyware or malware has been downloaded onto somebody's cell phone or iPad or computer or whatever device, can these programs be deleted by resetting the, um, the devices to factory settings, or are there other alternatives to removing that software? I'm actually going to hold off on giving an answer to that because I think Lisa is going to cover a lot of things that would discuss that, um, and if not, we can talk again later. Does that sound okay? That sounds great. Thank you so much. No problem. All right, so I'm going to move on to the technologies that stalkers misuse. Um, and you can see here it says cyberbullying and geolocation tracking. But on the next slide, you'll see that there's other tools, more technological tools that stalkers can use. Um, one is that they can install spyware to hack into your email. And remember, like, you know, people think, oh, hacking to my email, they're going into my email account. But like the cases I just discussed, there's also ways that you can do key logging spyware that will track someone, everything they type on a keyboard. And so they can track what password you're putting in and what you're doing and get screenshots. So that kind of goes beyond just signing into someone's email. Um, they can also use the Bluetooth or GPS to track a victim's location via your phone, tablet, or other Bluetooth GPS enabled device. And they can secretly turn on your device's camera or microphone to watch and listen to you. Uh, the third one I will discuss a little more in depth on the next page. Um, these are known kind of colloquially as uh, stalking apps. And these are various applications for mobile phones or mobile devices that are not sold on iTunes or Google Play. Um, what happens is the stalker or the abuser buys the application on the application's website, which is separate and apart from iTunes or Google Play, and then they can install that on the victim's phone. You usually need physical access to the mobile phone or device to install these applications. Um, the majority of these applications have various capabilities, which are all very creepy and scary. Um, they can listen and record phone conversations. They can read texts and emails, give you geolocation information, listen to ambient sounds through the microphone of the device, or even take pictures remotely from, through the device. Um, some of these touts, um, some of these apps tout themselves as being ways to monitor children or employees, but others you'll see them saying that they're useful for catching cheaters and monitoring your spouse or intimate partner. Um, we, uh, the Department of Justice recently found that one of these apps, stalking apps, violates the law, and it was Stealth Genie. And this application could monitor calls, texts, videos, and other communications on mobile phones without detection. Um, it was actually, uh, they indicted a Pakistani man, his last name was Akbar, in September 2014 and they indicted him in federal court in Virginia because Stealth Genie was hosted at a data center in Ashburn, Virginia. 
So when he came into the country, they arrested him and indicted him. So this was a criminal case, as opposed to what the FTC can do, which is only civil. This was a criminal case, and he was charged with the sale and advertisement of an interception device, among other charges. Um, the judge in this case gave the FBI authority to disable the Stealth Genie website, and Akbar ended up pleading guilty about two months later and was ordered to pay a $500,000 fine. Um, he didn't have to serve any time in prison because he served, he was uh, sentenced to time served, so what he'd already done. And he was also ordered to forfeit the source code for Stealth Genie to the government, and the website remains offline. This was the first criminal conviction concerning the advertisement and sale of a mobile device spyware app. And if you just search Stealth Genie and DOJ online, you can find a lot of articles about it, and it's pretty interesting. Um, so now that I've discussed that the, the tools that are available to abusers and stalkers, I'm going to turn it back to Lisa for her to discuss online safety tips. Thanks, Jacqueline. In light of all of these tools, it is understandable for us to wonder how can victims protect themselves. And I see a bunch of questions coming through the chat that I'll try to answer in the course of talking about these online safety tips that we've put together in conjunction with the Stalking Resource Center and also in consultation with the National Network to End Domestic Violence's online resources. So I'm bringing it down into first online safety on computers and then mobile safety on phones. So starting with computers, the first tip we have is a tip that we give to everyone, but it can be especially important to domestic violence or stalking victims, and that is to use strong passwords and change them frequently. A lot of people ask, what does it mean to have a strong password? Um, usually it means having a combination of letters, numbers, and special characters. We recommend having at least 10 characters, and 12 characters is ideal for most home users. In terms of passwords, especially since a lot of stalkers are people who the victim may know, it's especially important not to use passwords that include your name, date of birth, um, child's name, date of birth, or special events that the stalker may know about as well. Um, it's also important not to use the same password for different accounts and to have passwords at every level, on the phone, on the computer, and then within each account, on your bank account, on your cell phone account, or any other account that can allow you to have a password so that if the stalker gets in at one level, you have another level of protection. And probably the most important thing is to keep passwords private, not to share them, um, especially if you think you are or know you are um, being stalked. Another tip we have is that if a victim believes that someone might be monitoring them, to try to use a safer computer. And by a safer computer, we mean one that the abuser does not have access to or hasn't had access to in the past. Um, this may be using a computer at the home of a trusted friend or relative, or using it at the library, which, as I mentioned before, generally we tell people not to handle sensitive information at the library because you're going through a Wi-Fi network, which is not encrypted and less safe. But for domestic violence and stalking victims, it may be an exception to the general rule that a library may be a safer place to do certain online work than a computer in your home that the perpetrator has access to. It's especially important to use a safer computer if the victim is researching an escape plan or looking for new jobs or a new place to live, so for obvious reasons, so that the stalker can't find out and continue to stalk the victim. Um, we also suggest that when using that safer computer, that the victim change usernames and passwords on all their online accounts while they're on the safer computer, and then don't log back into those accounts on other computers that may be being monitored, because then the stalker perpetrator can find access to your new usernames and passwords. Another tip we want to talk about is cyberbullying, um, and this is a variation sort of on stalking and domestic violence. Um, when we talk about cyberbullying, we're talking about any harassment that happens online, whether through email, social media, um, sometimes even through texting. Our general advice on cyberbullying is that it's best not to respond, although we understand in the stalking and domestic violence context that that could cause the stalker to 
escalate their violent behavior. So with all of this advice, um, it's all ca caveated with, you know, the victim should connect with an advocate to discuss their situation and to work out a safety plan that is, you know, very particular to their situation because oftentimes victims will know what is going to escalate the situation with their particular stalker or perpetrator and will know what steps are most appropriate in their particular situation. Um, we do encourage victims while they not respond that they not delete things. They should save the evidence of the cyberbullying. This is particularly important if they ever want to prosecute the stalker or domestic violence victim or even if they want to get a stay away or protective order against them. To save that evidence, take screenshots, print the messages, or at least save it so that their attorney can later access that evidence of the bullying. Another option is to block the bully or stalker online. You can do that either by removing them from your friends list or by asking the particular website to remove them um, based on the bullying and stalking behavior. Um, again, this could escalate things and it's going to depend on the particular situation, whether that advice is appropriate um, and that's why we do advise victims to consult with victim advocates like a lot of you who are on this call. Um, another option is to have bogus profiles taken down. If somebody creates a whole new profile in the victim's name and puts up fake information there, um, then you should be able to call the company that runs the site and ask them to remove that information. Now, what if a perpetrator hacks into the victim's email? Um, people often wonder, how do you delete malware? And I would encourage you to go to the FTC's website. It has a great video on how to deal with malware at FTC.gov. Um, but basically, you want to make sure that your antivirus system is up to date. And you can delete malware by running a security scan and deleting what the security scan identifies as a problem. Um, you're also, if your email is hacked into, you're going to want to change your passwords on the email and possibly even consider setting up a new email account. Um, first, you could check with the email provider or the social networking site and check your account set settings. But depending on the extent of the hacked email and whether you think it is the stalker um, who is bothering you in other settings, you may want to consider setting up an email account not using your personal information so that it can't be connected to you and just use that email account for future use and safety. Um, I hear some beeping in the background, so if someone could um, make sure their phone is muted, that would be great. Thanks. Um, malware. People often ask, how can you tell if there's malware? on your computer. There are a few warning signs of malware. If your computer starts getting slow, if it won't shut down or restart, if there are a whole bunch of pop-ups that keep coming up that you've never asked for and are offering all sorts of things that you may or may not want. If there are new or unexpected toolbars or icons, um, so that's another warning sign. Another thing could be excessive battery drain beyond you know the usage that you would expect for you know, what you're actually doing on the computer. That can be a sign of malware as well. Um, and if you do think there's malware on your computer, it's important to be cautious about shopping or banking online and, again, to update security software. And um, I do want to mention that when using security software or tech support, there have been a whole bunch of tech support scams recently um, that the FTC has gone after and Microsoft has gone after too. There have been most people probably heard that or have gotten the calls themselves. I've gotten a call to, from someone saying they're from Microsoft and your computer is acting slow and slowing down and they'll help you. And then they, you know, go into your computer and basically they can spy on what you're doing and they use spyware to get your personal information. So if you do need tech support to remove malware, it's important to call the manufacturer, you know, or call other trusted tech support services. Um, now I will switch over to mobile phones and give you some tips on that. And I know that there was a question about mobile phones and, you know, can you delete 
um, malware or other information by resetting the factory settings. And I'll get into this more in a little bit, but we don't really recommend removing the factory settings and restrictions because that could make the phone more vulnerable to having spyware and other things installed on it. But in terms of general advice about mobile phones, you know, we generally advise everyone to think about privacy and safety on mobile phones. Um, a lot of people are treating, still treating phones like phones instead of like computers. And we're trying to train the general public that, you know, your mobile phone is really a mini computer that you're taking around with you. And you need to use the same kind of safety precautions you use on your computer on your mobile phone. So they need to be password protected. Um, they still need to be careful about photos and video sharing, especially because that could sometimes send geolocation information. Um, and also to be aware of social networking. And especially for younger teens and young adults, you know, we do try to get across the message that when social networking, what you post can have a bigger audience that you think, than you think. And it's very important to check the privacy settings, make sure you're only um, sharing with friends and that you're only including friends who are people who you physically have met and know. Um, I know a good friend of mine works at Department of Justice's Child Exploitation Division and said that the vast majority of her child exploitation cases start online with someone the person doesn't know and then, you know, turns into an exploitation or sometimes stalking type situation. So, you know, one tip we have, especially for younger adults is don't friend people who you don't actually know in person. So other tips in terms of mobile phones are to choose the right options and features for your phone. Everybody wants the fanciest gadgets right now, but especially for stalking and domestic violence victims, we would suggest considering non-smartphones and phones that don't have geolocation services on them so that the stalker can't um, track you, or if you have one with location-based services, which most phones do now, you know, be very careful about when your GPS is enabled and turn off Bluetooth at a minimum when you're not using it. I personally would say just don't use Bluetooth and don't use GPS if you know you're being stalked because if you turn it off and then you turn it back on for some limited purpose, then that's when the stalker finds you. I know some people find that advice not so practical um, because they're, they're used to using Bluetooth and GPS, but, you know, in certain situations we have to look at the convenience of technology versus the risk of using it. Um, another tip that we want to make sure that people know about is if they're going to dispose of their phone, they should do so safely. Um, first, we recommend for DV and stalking victims to think about possibly keeping their phone to preserve the evidence of abuse and then getting a new phone, a safer phone to use, but don't dispose of that other phone um, because not only does that preserve evidence of abuse, but it may help so that you aren't escalating the violent tendencies of the stalker who is angered by you getting rid of the phone that they were tracking you on. If you just keep it at your house and preserve the evidence of continued abuse and use a new phone to figure out your safety plan, um, that's probably the best advice. But if you do get rid of your phone or the victim does get rid of their phone, it's very important to remove the SIM card and all personal information before doing so, that, so that somebody else doesn't get all that information on all that evidence and destroy it or misuse it. Some tips specifically for victims of domestic violence and stalking. Tip number one is to know where your phone is at all times. Like Jacqueline said, the malware and spyware and tracking apps, they can be installed in just a few minutes. So um, for most people, you know, leaving your phone on the charging station overnight while you sleep might be okay. But if you're a stalking victim or DV victim who lives with the perpetrator, then that might be an opportunity for that perpetrator to take the phone off and install a tracking app. It can also be an opportunity for them to change the account and security features to make the phone more vulnerable. So that's a tip to pass on to 
victims is to make sure they know where their phone is at all times and not leave it out where the perpetrator can get to it and install my malware or change the phone settings. The other tip we have is to check your phone settings. Um, check Bluetooth and GPS, make sure they're turned off when you're not using them or turn them off at all times, even better. Um, and in your situation, a victim advocate can help strategize this specific safety plan for your situation. Um, it may be, again, that turning off Bluetooth or GPS will immediately anger um, the person who is your stalker and cause violence, but they also won't necessarily know where you are. So if you've been able to move to a safe place, you know, obviously all of you are victims advocates and can help walk people through, you know, the timing and sequencing of these tips so that they can do so safely and not further risk any sort of violence. Another tip we have for victims of domestic violence and stalking is that if you're not sure if your phone is being monitored, here are a few things you can look for. Um, and I do want to say above all that it's important to trust your gut and both for the victims and for the advocates. Um, to trust your gut and if you feel threatened or uncomfortable online to trust that. But there are specific things you can look for and that's um, patterns or behaviors. Like what does the person know? Do they know who you talk to? Do they know all the conversations you had? Um, do they have access to your wireless carrier's account? If they do, they can turn on features like Family Locator or Find My Phone. They can also access your billing records and see call logs so they can find out who you've been talking to. And that can be particularly problematic if it's a, you know, former intimate partner and the victim is now with a new intimate partner and that's part of what's angering the stalker. Um, so one tip that we have for people is if they are, if they do have a perpetrator who has access to a wireless carrier's account, then to try to get a new phone, either with a different carrier or with a pay-as-you-go plan. Uh, other tips to look for is does the perpetrator or stalker seem to know your location? Um, you can check your phone to see whether the locate my phone features are on, and it's also good to ask your friends or family not to mention your location on social media, not to say, you know, hey, this victim is here visiting me in California now, um, because then that could ruin somebody's escape. Or even taking pictures with them and posting them on Facebook um, could show where you are if there's a stalker trying to come after you. Another thing to look for is whether there is unusual activity on a victim's phone Again, excessive battery drain or a spike in data usage can be signs of the fact that your phone is being monitored. Um, you can also think about whether you, the perpetrator knows where you are when you're not on the phone because maybe they install GPS in the car. And if you can figure out or narrow down how they're tracking you, that can help you develop a safety plan to know whether the victim is being tracked on their cell phone or through their car or otherwise. Um, in terms of how to tell if the apps are on the phone, which I saw that somebody asked about, um, you can tell to a certain extent what apps are on there. And we sometimes recommend if you see an app that you don't recognize um, and it's not one that came you know, installed on your phone, then to delete it. But there are also are some apps that go on there that you cannot see. Um, so it's not a foolproof method. So that leads us to tip number four, which is that if you think your phone is being monitored, the safest thing to do is to get a new phone um, with an account the abuser doesn't have access to. And this can be done through Verizon Hope Line. It can be done through SafeLink Wireless for low-income people. And I know some um, House of Roof shelters give out phones to um, DV victims who stay at them too. And like I said before, sometimes we recommend that victims consider a pay-as-you-go phone at a minimum to switch carriers and phone numbers. Another tip is to purchase a phone with cash to avoid the phone being connected to your personal information and to make sure that the victim is the only account holder and to also have the victim check to see what notifications 
that they'll get if features are added or removed from their phone because that way if the stalker is adding or removing things, then you know some services may give them warnings that there are new features being added on. So while you can check for certain things, whether certain apps are on your phone and whether you're being tracked on your phone to a certain extent, the safest thing we say is to get a new phone with a new carrier that the abuser did not have access to and does not have access to. So before we get to your questions, we just want to remind you about some of the resources I talked about at the beginning. OnGuardOnline.gov is where you can get NetCetera. It's also where you can sign up for blogs about online safety, including any blogs we might have in the future about domestic violence and online safety. You can also order free copies in bulk um, from our bulk order site, which is bulkorder.ftc.gov. You can even co-brand these with your own organization's name and give them out, and that's what they're there for, so we hope you will order them and use them. And a lot of them are available in Spanish as well if you work with Spanish-speaking populations. And again, um, we want to remind you that if you do have victims, to please file complaints with the FTC at ftc.gov slash complaint. We do look at those complaints for trends and also for law enforcement purposes, and other agencies do too. Um, you're also welcome to contact me or Jacqueline directly if you feel like you're hearing about something like Stealth Genie or the new iteration of spyware that you're seeing a whole bunch of victims um, having put on their phones, we would love to hear about something like that so we can see if it's something we might want to investigate. Um, other resources we do want to point out and caveat everything that you know, if the victim's in danger right now, they should call 911 or the National Domestic Violence Hotline or consult the Stalking Resource Center. And we are happy to take your questions now, but we also have put our emails here so that you can follow up with us after the presentation if you have any other questions. And before we get to those questions, I just want to mention a caveat that we're required to give with our presentations, which is that the comments we make today, both in our presentation and our questions, are not the position of the Federal Trade Commission or any commissioners. They're just the position of us as individuals. So with that, we'd be happy to take questions from the audience. Great. Thank you so much, Lisa and Jacqueline. Uh, if folks have questions, feel free to type them in the public chat area or to me directly, and we can make sure that they get asked. Uh, a couple, Lisa, that have come through while people are thinking about questions they might have. Um, Jacqueline, one was in relation to the Stealth Genie case, and I'm not sure if this is a question for you or someone at DOJ, but they were curious to know why part of the sentencing and the decision made was that the Stealth Genie creator needed to turn over the source code of the program to the government. Um, I think the, the question is sort of like, what is the government doing with that source code? Uh, well, I honestly, I don't know because, uh, like you said, the Department of Justice did that. Um, I would assume that, you know, I don't, I, I don't know for sure, but the government, I'm taking, kind of taking it off the market, you know, not letting it stay out there for someone else to use it. Um, that is just a guess, <laughs> an educated guess, but I don't know why it was part of the order. Great, great, thank you. And another question that came through was um, they're wondering what rights they have um, as consumers from your perspective if they choose to do things with their phones like jailbreak them or root them um, and essentially make them available to apps that you can't buy on iTunes or in Google Play. Do they still have any recourse as consumers if they end up getting a spyware program on their phones? I don't know that much about that. Um, the very little that I've looked into it, I know your kind of your carriers and the operating systems of phones usually say that they, no warranty is available if you root or jailbreak your phone. And for people who might not know what that means, uh, that means kind of getting the administrative rights to the phone. And a lot of these stalking apps require that you jailbreak or root the phone for them to be installed and so that they're hidden on the phone. Um, 
I would, I think it's dependent too on your carrier and the operating system. So I would check there to see what they say about jailbreaking um, and rooting the phone. And just to add to that, like we mentioned before, we don't recommend that victims get a jailbroken phone or jailbreak their own phone because removing the manufacturer or carrier's restrictions can make them more vulnerable to malware and spyware. Absolutely, and that actually kind of ties into another question that just came through about um, a lot of folks work with low-income clients, and oftentimes they are given phones by their potentially abusive partners, and how are they supposed to know if any of this stuff is on their phone? In terms of finding out if one of these apps has been installed on the phone, unfortunately, we don't really have an answer for you besides what Lisa talked about. You know, check for, you know, do they know that you went to visit with your attorney today and how would they, how would the abuser or stalker know that? You, and trust your gut, know that if, you know, how do they know that aspect of a conversation I had with a third person? Um, this is kind of in, the inherent aspect of these apps is that they're meant to be hidden. So we won't be able to find them. Um, but the best advice right now is to follow the safety tips discussed by Lisa and just keep your eyes open to like what's happening and what's weird. And also to, you know, if you think your phone is being monitored to try to get a new phone. I mean, even there are programs for low income people like the SafeLink Wireless and um, like House of Worth Roof often has programs as well to give domestic violence or stalking victims safe phones so that they can use it. And yeah, unfortunately, like Jacqueline says, you can check permissions, you can check for what apps are there, but that's not going to help you find some of these um, spyware and malware because they're designed to be hidden. So that's why our advice is to consider getting a new phone that wasn't given to you by, you know, the perpetrator. And there are free programs for low-income people, and there's also the option of a pay-as-you-go phone. Hey, and I think you might see another question that came through on the public chat. Um, Don is wondering if you found any one provider more agreeable to help victims get new phones and phone numbers without having to have two contracts. Um, I just know that Verizon Hopeline and SafeLink Wireless are two um, resources that the National Network to End Domestic Violence recommends in terms of sources for getting new phones, but I don't know if there's any more, one provider that's, you know, most agreeable to helping victims. Great. Thank you for that. And I know we have another question about um, the options available for stalking victims who have an order of protection and the behavior continues. And the local police is aware and um, still not helping the victim. And, you know, that's certainly, I'll just answer this as the Deputy Director of the Stalking Resource Center, that is certainly an issue that um, we can assist victim advocates and folks troubleshoot around. And so if you have a specific case that you're working on and would like to get kind of a, a technical assistance consultation, we would be more than happy to kind of brainstorm with you and, and throw around some ideas. Um, so please do be in touch with us on that. Right, and also, you know, if you have an attorney who helps you with the protective order, you can consult with them to see if the continuing behavior is a violation of the protective order and whether, you know, the case ought to be brought back to court as a violation of the protective order. Great. Um, if there are any other questions, please feel free to type them into the, um, the public chat area. Uh, while we're getting ready for just to wait to see if anybody else has any other questions. Jess wanted to tell you about an upcoming webinar that we have next month. Yeah, so we have um, a webinar next month, uh, Media Literacy and the Social Normalization of Stalking. Uh, it's Thursday, May 14th, uh, 2 to 3.30. You can register on our website. Um, and again, that's um, victimsofcrime.org slash SRC. Uh, and uh, it's going to be a really exciting um, webinar. We've been looking forward to it for a while. Um, so if you like this one, uh, sign up for our next webinar. Uh, we'd love to have you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I think if we have any other questions that come through, we will make sure that they get to Lisa and to Jacqueline. Um, there's one final question before we sort of close out today from Diana. And Jess, would you please read that and ask that of, uh, of our speakers? 
Yeah, so Diana wants to know, how do you prove there's unwanted software on your phone for situations uh, like plenary court dates? Uh, that's a very good question. You probably have to get a technical or forensic expert to look at the phone and to testify that they found, you know, the spyware on the phone. I mean, we've talked to law enforcement um, agencies across the country, and this is an issue that we're trying to work, you know, on right now. And we're aware, and that it, and again, it goes back to the software is meant to be hidden. And so we have to like kind of find new ways to figure out that it's there and use it as evidence. Yeah, and of course you could also always point to all the other factors like, you know, the person knows where I am, they know the contents of all my conversations. You know, it's not direct evidence, but it's, if there's enough circumstantial evidence, maybe the court would believe that, okay, there must be something on their phone because how else would this person know all this information that's obviously directly connected to the phone. And also just to keep in mind that a lot of these stalking apps have kind of web-based logins for the abusers and stalkers. So there's evidence on that end of what they're able to see. So it's not just all going to be on the phone. Are there any other questions? Well, we're happy to answer any questions by email that people may think of in the future, and we do want to thank the Stalking Resource Center for hosting this webinar. Thank you guys so much. Um, tons of great information. Um, and so if you have any questions, feel free to um, email or reach out to Rebecca or I at the Stalking Resource Center or to Lisa and Jacqueline. Their um, information is right there. And again, I just want to remind you that the um, recording and the slides for this webinar will be on the website the Stocking Resource Center's website, within, hopefully within a day or two by Friday afternoon, I'm thinking. Um, so look out for that. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's been great um, getting to chat with you all, and uh, have a great day, everyone. Thanks.